fourth verse on that was very simple. It says, uh, I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. T'was believing on his name, hallelujah. I trusted and he saved my soul. Simple, simple, that's easy. And so very, very thankful for that. And uh, he's the one that did the hard work for us. He's the one that gave his son to die for us. And I'm thankful for that type of song of testimony. That really is testimony. We start off singing like that this evening. And so that's good. Uh, also the first song. I don't know. We haven't sang that song in a while. Uh, that it's, um, what's that? Oh, yeah, I thought you said it ha we have sang. Okay, no, we haven't sang in a while. All right, we agree. Good. So, um, so yes, as far as uh, that goes, um, we're, we'll see Christ. We'll see him. And so um, the, the, mess, the songs selected, specifically that one, uh, the second one I just liked. The first one was because of the message tonight. We're going to be Daniel chapter 11 and 12 tonight. And um, we've got two more messages in Daniel, kind of. Today is going to kind of finish it off, but it's loose. All right, it's a very loose ending. But there's a lot of stuff that's left unfinished, and so we still have to address a lot of it. And so there's, so I, I, but I, as far as the context of everything that's going on here, there's subjects that we're, I'm picking. So when I say I'm ending, I'm, I'm ending the chrono chronological aspect of studying Daniel 12. In other words, as far as the sequence, the way it's laid out. But we will be coming back to address it. Um, there's a big overlap as far as some of the stuff that's going on or studying 1 Corinthians with what we're going over in Daniel. So, um, so some of these things will be hit later. I was telling Justin earlier, I'll be doing a message on... Um, on the resurrection, which we'll see right there at the beginning of Daniel chapter 12. Um, but I'm not sure if I'll make it into two messages, but we're going to see a lot of, a lot of detail on that in, in 1 Corinthians as well. And so, um, so entertaining the idea of preaching a message on the resurrection from the Old Testament and then um, one from the New Testament. Not that it's, it's not two different kinds of resurrections. Right? I don't believe like the Old Testament has something special for them and we get something different for us. It's, it's not like that, but we're talking about the same resurrection. So, um, so anyways, but there's, there's a great deal of study um, that I think would be helpful for the church to know. So anyways, go to Daniel chapter number 11, and uh, this is a subject that um, I had <clears throat> in studying this has been interesting for me because um, there's a lot of things that, that I've, I've learned, I've heard, I've, I've said even that, that I look back and like, well, I guess this kind of accurate, but maybe it's not accurate. And uh, for instance, we use the phrase "antichrist" for everything, right? Uh, you don't realize that, that that label "antichrist" is actually a very specific label, and it's one that's not typically always applicable to the way we always use it. Now, we'll just say it generally, anyways. And I think it's okay to say, in the sense that, like, kind of like, for instance, we would say heaven, like, hey, is heaven your eternal home? Well, no, not really. It's nobody's eternal home forever because forever God's got an eternal home for us, the new heaven and new earth and, and the, the, the heavenly city that's going to de descend and we're going to live with him for eternity. And so we're not going to go and live in heaven uh, for eternity. And so, but we say the, the phrase heaven and we, we generally know what we're talking about. We're talking about eternity. And so I'm going I'm to move this around a little bit. Sorry. That was awkward, I know. Sorry, but it's all tangled up. Okay, all right. So anyways, uh, so when we say the phrase Antichrist, a lot of it has to do with the reference in the New Testament that's addressing um, specifically uh, religious apostasy, if I could say it that way, having to, to do with, um, with the false doctrine. And so uh, when we refer to what we're going to be talking about today, uh, and later on you'll find this as well in the book of Revelation, um, for Second Thessalonians, it's, it's referring to the man of sin. Uh, the the Bible is describing this this individual this indi uh, this one that's going to be leading, uh, and it's not just in a religious manner. We're talking about politically. There are other players involved in all this when it comes down to the Book of Revelation, and so we'll get more into that in uh, in weeks. To well, I don't know when we'll get to that part in Revelation. Um, I'm, I don't. One day, one day. All right. So, anyways, um, but with this one. Uh, we're going to start here in verse number 36 of chapter number 11. Now, um, I'll be honest, going through Daniel chapter 11, I used to read it in such a way that when you look at it, you say, okay, well, all of this is Antiochus Epiphanes. And um, in any ways, you, we went through that um, like November. That was the last message on this. It was November. And uh, there's a lot of detail in there. And, and honestly, as I went through, I'm like, there was so much detail. It's very confusing. It's not, to be honest, it's not incredibly confusing to understand. It's incredibly confusing to explain. And uh, I, my goal had been to make a chart and be like, all right, this verse means this and this and this and this and this, and it makes it easier to see it. But when you're just saying like, he then went there and they went here and he did this and then they, he did that, it gets a little confusing to say it that way when you don't have a lot of specific names to deal with or like a country or something like that. So, um, 
So anyways, um, anyways, we've been going through this, but there's a slight change, and we'll see this. Um, I, I, I've, um, I've changed, and I can be swayed again, all right? So I'm, I'm not saying that I, this, I'm 100% sure, but I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty certain that there's a change here in verse number 36 um, because of something that's going to take place here um, that basically what we're going to find, the things we're going to read in verse 36 didn't happen with Antiochus Epiphanes, um, and it, it's different. And not only that, what we're going to see here, and just to go on here, um, this is describing, this is the vision that, that God has has given Daniel, and this is the final vision that God has given Daniel. D chapter number 11 and 12 are part of a final vision. In fact, chapter 10 was the introduction to it as far as things going on. Chapter 11 and 12 are part of the same vision. Now, to explain that, earlier on, he had given visions of the kingdoms that were going to come. What Does anybody remember the kingdoms that were going to come as far as from the time of Daniel, including the one he was in? Anybody remember? What was the first one? Or you can give all four. Come on. What's that? Yes, that's that's right. Exactly. So, um, well, well, but Daniel was presently in in which nation though? Which what's that? Uh, you got it. Close. Trick question. All right. So it was Babylon, but by the time we get to chapter number eleven, it's actually now Persia. So it's kind of a trick question because yes, it was both of them, right? So you have Daniel, Persia, Grecia, which I just think is a cool name. I would rather be part of Grecia than Greece, and so. Um, Anyways, uh, which is near Hungary and, and Turkey, which there's an irony, there's an irony involved in all of that. So anyways, um, but with, with that, um, so Greece yeah, is what's coming next, and then after that is the fourth and final kingdom, which is Rome. Now here's what's interesting. When you get into chapter number 11, he's pointing to things that are going to happen. And if you remember why this vision is coming to Daniel, is because of what? Does anybody remember why God is giving Daniel this vision in chapter number 11 and 12? Anybody know? Anybody have a thought? Besides, he wants us to know about it and wants to pen in scriptures. He asked about it. Yes, exactly right. He prayed. He asked. So Daniel asked, and God said, all right, here's the explanation. So he gives this explanation. And in context of why, it was in reference to a query, a query, a query, a question. I'll say that way. A question that he had uh, from a passage or from a book of the Bible. What, what book was, what, was the, what caused these questions in Daniel? Jeremiah. So Daniel read Jeremiah, and he's there in... Persia now, after 70 years of captivity, with the expectation of things to take place, and they haven't taken place the way he thought they would, and so he beseeches the Lord, and he says, according to Jeremiah, it's one thing, then how come this hasn't happened like we thought it would? So what God does here in Daniel chapter 11 and 12, he gives this explanation as far as how this is working out, and he's push, pointing it, it's not just that Israel would be restored, okay, that sounds good but they haven't been, all right? So that's not how it worked out, okay? So are they going to get the nation? Everything's going to go great, and, and, and when I'm in my 80s, we'll go back and we'll have a big party because everything's going to be good there? Not quite. That was a near and far vision of things going on. Just to explain it this way, um, a number of years ago, back when I was, I think, 25 or something like that, my wife and I went to Peru, and so uh, we didn't have any kids yet. We'd been married a short time. I think maybe 26 or 27. I can't remember. But anyways, went to Peru, and uh, when we were there, we went to this area called Cusco. Anybody know what Cusco is? Uh, it's a t and then and when we were in Cusco, it's really... It's a, it's a historical city of the Inca Empire. It was the capital of the Inca Empire. And it was, it's really cool. It's a really cool place. Um, so we did a lot of the historical stuff there. But then the big reason we were there, the same reason everybody's there, is to go to another place, a, a city called Machu Picchu, which is an awkward name. And I'm thankful we don't, we don't name our towns like that nowadays. But anyway, Machu Picchu is way out there. And so you have to take a train for several hours through these forests and rainforests to get out there. So you're going through jungles and stuff. It's kind of cool, to be honest with you. And the trains are, are beautiful, and you have these glass tops so you can see everything out. And, and it's really neat. And so, um, so anyways, we're headed out there, and we'd gone through like a, an hour's worth of going through the mountains there. And one thing I saw, which was really cool, I mean, it's hot. And it's beautiful blue skies, and you see these mountains. And it looked like, as I was looking, there was mountains, and one mountain right by it was covered in snow. And it, it, I mean, it's just right there. So you have mountain of green, mountain of green, mountain of snow, mountain of green. And it's not like it was way higher, although it was. Now, here's the, here's the issue. When, from my vantage point in the train, I can see the mountains, and they all look really close to each other when you look at mountaintops. But if you get up there, you realize something. There's a lot of space in between. It's the same vision, but you're seeing different mountaintops. If I could put it this way, what God is giving Daniel in this revelation from chapter number 11 and 12, the same vision, the same vision. When God gives him this explanation, these two chapters, he's giving him a lot of distance. 
And so in this first section, we start seeing about Antiochus Epiphanes. You see, and it's not just Antiochus Epiphanes. You, see, you hear about the Maccabees and that revolt. You, you see things going on as far as following that. As, um, back in chapter 8, you see things pre, um, pre-birth of Christ. Chapter number 11 and 12. In this vision, you see the Roman takeover of Jerusalem. But it started something. Specifically, it's that Rome completely demolished Jerusalem. And it stayed that way until the end. This is important because this demolishing of Jerusalem is such that it would never be restored properly until Christ himself would restore it. Now, this is important. Why is this important? Because a lot of people say, well, this was all completed. uh, Prophecy's done. Because back in uh, 70 years ago, Israel came back together. In fact, you have the Balfour Declaration, and you have people coming into Jerusalem, and they rebuild the city, and they put up stuff, and now you have the nation of Israel, and so, ha, huh. so that's it, fulfillment of prophecy. Now, now that's neat, because it points something, uh, for instance, end-time events can talk about uh, a temple, and there's going to be an abomination of desolation, so they have to be there, so it's pointing to it, but it's not the fulfillment, because Christ himself is not the one that restored Jerusalem. So, so this is important, um, because a lot of things get, get mixed up. So what he's doing, he's pointing to the destruction of Rome, and inside, I'm sorry, Rome destroying it, inside that same explanation of Rome destroying it, that continues with Rome's control there of Jerusalem, which is all centered on Jerusalem, by the way, with Rome's control of Jerusalem all the way until the end of chapter number 12, which is when, G- when Jesus makes everything right. And so this is all leading up to those things. And so what he's saying is you see the front top of that mountain of, of, of Antiochus Epiphanes destroying, and you're going to keep seeing it with the man of sin, who we frequently call the Antichrist. And then we're going to see it all the way until the judgments. All these things that are going on, all these things, even to the point of Jesus Christ coming and restoring, and, and he's the one that takes over for an eternal kingdom. And so uh, anyways, there's a lot of information here. Um, for similar readings to this, you can find uh, 2 Thessalonians is very helpful. The book of Revelation also helpful. Uh, chapter 8, chapter 12, 13, 17, 19. All those chapters lead, uh, explain a lot of the things that are going on here. And so, um, anyways, with that lengthy introduction, let's go ahead and start in verse number 36. We've just finished off with Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, in verse number 36, notice what it says here. And the king shall do according to his will. Now, Based on most readings of this, I would have said, well, that's still just talking about the king Antiochus Epiphanes. But notice what some of the things that are going to happen. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that for that, that is determined shall be done. Now, this is important, what he's explaining here. A couple things. One, talks about him exalting himself as God. Now, a couple things. One, it's already said that. It's explained what he's going to do. He's going to take over. He's already said this earlier on in the chapter. So he's like just repeating it, except for the fact this is slightly different in that he is going to um, be above every god. Now, in other words, in a whole bunch, whole bunch of gods, Antiochus Epiphanes did raise up his name as a god, but not above every god. In fact, what we find is he gave himself the same designation that all the other Roman emperors had as well. So he didn't do anything unusual, which means it could have been anybody, except for, of course, he's the one that did the same thing. And on top of that, there is more reference in regards to, um, well, I guess, um, to explain, there's more reference as far as to what the God's final plan is going to be in this verse, because notice at the end of verse number 36, he said, um, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished finished, finalized, which, uh, what's going to happen. For that that is determined shall be done. Here's what God is saying. There's a plan that God has, and what he's allowing in this, what is determined is to allow those things that would allow the indignation to be accomplished. These things that would bring about the very fury and wrath of God are going to be allowed to be accomplished. This is what's going to take place because it's determined. And so this is really a big thing because what he's explained to us, there's going to be a time period where this is going to happen, where this one is going to within the bounds of Rome. And we talked about it back in chapter 
several chap couple chapters, like chapter number two, chapter five, where we talked about the, the empires and the things that are going on there that were still within the bounds of Rome. Rome has never died, right? Rome's still around. People say it ended somewhere in the 500s. It never ended. It never ended. Rome, Rome is still around. And so we're going to see this revival of this, of this nation in, in manners that are going to be different than what we saw in the past. But, um, but as far as this go, at the very end of this, this is the culmination of man trampling down Jerusalem and man fighting against God. And what's happening is at this time where things seem to have gone well, the 70th week starts and such that he starts setting up the covenant with the people. And uh, what's going to happen is this one will be right, he'll rise up as one that, um, that has taken over and he is going to be like God. But while it seems like it's going so, so bad and it seems like this whole world is falling apart and it seems like everything is unraveling, you'll notice that it is determined. It's determined. So what I want you to catch with this is that when we look at the prophecy here in Daniel, it is not for us to look at prophecy and think, okay, well, let me figure out how this bomb is going to explode and everything is going to go bad. That's not what it's about. What he's laying out the groundwork for is the determination of how God is accomplishing his battle strategy. That's all it is. He's telling you how it's going to work. Uh, I, I enjoy reading books on warfare, and I've got a number of books on like uh, Bible warfare and like different battles that took place in the Bible and how uh, just the strategy that was involved, and I really enjoy them. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that uh, one, one thing that they'll allow is for enemies to make advances for the purpose of surrounding the enemy. And, uh, or be, allows them to flank them. Basically, with the advance, they will, they will um, weaken certain areas that allows the other the people that are fighting them to, to flank them, to get around them. And what this allows them to do is basically now they're surrounded. They, they seem to advance, but here's the problem. Now they're surrounded. Now they're actually weaker. Now they're going to get destroyed. And there's a number of battles where they allow this type of thing, even to the point of even invasions that they've allowed of cities for the purpose of destroying an army. And if I could put it this way, here's what God's doing. He's saying, all right. You're going to fight me. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, let you, I'll open the doors, and I'll let you right in. But you remember, you're in my territory. By the way, all the earth is God's. So there's not going to be a place where you can go like, okay, well, now we're going to win. It belonged to him anyways. And so what he's doing, though, is I've determined. In other words, I have laid out a plan, a strategy, a strategy for which I will defeat my enemies, which includes a lot of enemies, not just people. We're talking about Satan himself. And so there's a lot that's taking place. Uh, involved in this. So it is determined and it shall be done. And so while it seems discouraging the events that are taking place around the world, what God wants you to know is something here very clearly. He's got a plan and he's giving you a glimpse into that plan. And so anyway, there's a lot that's going on there. Um, in in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible tells us in verse 3, let no man deceive you. By any means, for that day shall not come. Which day is coming? The, com the time in which the, this, um, this one, this man of sin is going to come. And he's going to accomplish those things where he's prophesied of in both the Old and New Testament, where he's going to come to destroy. He's going to exalt himself uh, above the God of God, above God himself. And when he does these things, it doesn't take place unless he allows it. Uh, and it says, except there come a falling away first. That falling away first means very clearly that there is a falling away. This is something bad that happens uh, when it comes to uh, the worship of God himself. This would be people falling far away from that. This is not a positive. I've heard people preach this as a, like, then things go great. No, that's bad. This is sinful stuff that's going on, um, just like it's written. And that and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Same, same thing, right? Same, basically almost parallel. Or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He takes place of the position. Doesn't that sound familiar from Isaiah? In chapter 14, when Lucifer himself, Satan, who would try to be like the Most High. He would exalt his throne into the heavens. This is the devil himself. Now, we'll see more about that in just a little bit as far as, like, is this Satan himself that comes down from heaven? We'll talk a little bit about that. But, anyways, it's very clear. And so, anyways, um, this, is, this is this man of sin that we're talking about who we frequently call, as I said before, the Antichrist. This is determined. God knows what is happening, and it will all work out according to his plan. These are the signs of his judgment and certainty of his victory. So here's how it works. When these details come together, and by the way, we see stuff coming around in society today, and we look at things like, aha, prophecy is pointing, things coming around. Here's what's going on. 
You're seeing him allow those times which are fitting in specifically into his plan. Scary. Scary seemingly. But it's according to his plan, which should give us what? Security, confidence, hope. Hey, God, God said this would happen, and it's happening. His strategy, strategy is working. It's taking place. And we're seeing it unfold um, even before our very eyes, even though these specific events haven't taken place yet. Things fall into place. And so anything, anyways, we have this idea that everything is falling apart. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is to not look at the scope or at the, at this. don't look at this through a lens of the world is falling. The world is falling apart. The sky is falling, excuse me. And, um, and look at it more instead of focusing on the problem, focus on the victory. This is the victory of God himself over the forces of all evil in this world. This is what's taking place. And so when you get discouraged about it, you're getting discouraged about what God has already just started to unroll in his plan. He's allowing these things to take place. This is the sentence that is rolled out against our great enemy. By the way, God has already decreed the sentence that would be taking place against these that would rise up against him, against the man of sin, against the devil himself. The sentence is already written out. This is what God is going to do. He is simply moving in turn to accomplish the victory that he has already planned. And so this, uh, this man of sin then will blasphemously exalt himself as God himself that will reveal the judgment that is deserved by the great deceiver and the culmination of man's humanism. Basically, man is, come, is bringing all this up and exalting this guy. And by the way, he may be doing this, and it sometimes seems like he's doing this while fighting off a bunch of people in Jerusalem, but that's not the case. It seems that he's ushered in. It seems that he's given opportunity because when we're going to find the book of Revelation in chapter number 13, the Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Here's what he's saying. Anybody that's not saved will worship this guy. So in other words, he goes in there and he defiles the temple. And it's going to be to the sound of applause. It's going to be a sound to cheers. It's going to be televised. People will see it and they will be glad except for believers. Anybody who's saved will not accept this at all. In fact, uh, beyond that, we believe that they will be worshiping Satan himself, the one who gave power. Because back in verse number four, it talks about that they worship the one that gave him power, gave the beast power to do so. And so they're worshiping the devil and this man. And so this worship is taking place. And so this is something that's going on here. Um, obviously, very, very bad. Now look down to verse number 37, a little bit about this guy. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he, him, he shall magnify himself above all. Once again, you see this theme there about him being higher. Now, it says a couple things, a couple clues into, into what he is like. Uh, to be honest, I don't know the full details about this, and I'm very okay with not knowing the full details because he's going to tell us something in chapter 12 that will give a lot of relief from that. Um, but a few things about this. One is that he does say that he shall not regard the God of his fathers, which is interesting because the God, lowercase or uppercase G, uppercase, so this is a divine being. Some, some translations will put lowercase G and then they will make it even plural, the gods of his father. Now, but he says the God of his fathers. Now, a couple of interesting things about this. If it was the gods, lowercase g, or anything else, it would have been the worship of false deities, which according to the scriptures is devil worship. That's, that's what it is. And so that means what he's saying here, and, and this is what I'm inclined to understand from this, is that this is talking about somebody with some sort of Jewish ancestry that has worship of the almighty God in their ancestry. Can I put it this way? The guy's probably Jewish or at least have some kind of Jewish blood. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I've heard a number of, of theories, okay? Um, one, one of the most out there theories on it, I'm just going to tell you because, and please, I just promise me, you will not, like, start pouring over this and start, like, Googling it, okay? Uh, that's not research, all right? But, but anyways, don't, don't go, like, oh, okay, this is what it is. Um, one person came to me and gave me a stack, I mean, a stack. And I knew nothing about prophecy at this time. I thought I did. I thought I knew everything. But I, um, and even now as I'm studying, I'm like, wow, there's so much I don't know. Um, but anyways, they gave me a stack of stuff in this manila folder. And it all culminated to the fact that this guy is actually the leader of the Freemasons. And, um, and, and the reason we know that is because there's no pictures of his existence. 
Nobody knows who it is. We, we know, they, they know, nobody knows who it is except for this lady. She knows who he, who he is. And uh, she even has a picture that's like a half of his face like in the distance that somebody took by accident. And that's, that's who the leader of the Freemasons are. Um, and that's who it is. And I forgot all the theological reasons for why. And they gave a lot of stories and stuff like that. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Just, just, just throw it into the trash bin of your mind there. Just like... All right, it's, it's, it, for one thing, it's not going to help you, okay? Um, the, the other part, there are some, some biblical ideas as well. For instance, in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 49, when it gives the description of the, of the tribes of Israel, as far as the leadership there, he explains to Dan that Dan is going to, going to rule over his people. And he describes them that he will be a serpent, an adder, that he will bite at their heels. Uh, the idea of the destruction there that he's going to do. And then later on, you go to the book of Revelation and list the 12 tribes, and it doesn't list... Dan. And so it excludes them. Now, later on, it's going to describe about the, the introduction as far as, um, the, as far as how that'll work out. I can't remember the passage where it's going to include Dan in an end times event as well. I'm not sure how that works, but some people say, well, then that means that the Antichrist must be Jewish from the tribe of Dan. Is that the case? I don't know. The other part is that um, there's a lot of Jews out there that, um, and remember, we, I, I, I don't remember how long it was like um, a year ago, we gave the description of the, the four different labels for Jews as far as in the Bible, what they are, and it's not all, not everything is Jewish, okay? So, um, but anyways, when it comes to that, for instance, the, the royal, the British crown, the British crown claims the right of ruling based on the divine right of kings. What that means is that God said they should be kings. And I remember in school, I'm like, okay, so they say that they're nuts, but they take it a step further. The reason they say that is because they're of the lineage of David, and they traced their genealogy to King David. And so they said, ah, so we're of that as well. And so they claim this kind of right. In fact, you'll notice that the royal families in Europe are all related, which is gross and weird, but regardless, they're related. And, um, and anyways, because they claim the similar rights, and so now it is, so people say, oh, so what it means, it's, uh, it's Prince Williams, one of Prince, I don't know what his oldest son's name is, but whatever his son's name is, that must be the, the, the Antichrist because of that. Okay, maybe. It could be. I don't know. I have no idea because they claim this stuff and I, I don't know. The, the point is, the point is that, um, that, that he's somehow associated in that way. Now, what this means, um, when you find about the gods of their fathers, it doesn't always mean that the gods of their fathers were necessarily a god that they served. Just simply that it was acknowledged that that seemed to be the, their god in some way. For instance, there's a number of times that the nation of Israel or Judah, are refer there's reference to the god of their fathers and it's referencing people that that weren't good people, right? So, so anyways, the, it's, it's the idea here naturally that that's what's playing there. And so uh, people that, that were apart from relationship with God. So anyways, there, there's that aspect. And the second part here has to do with uh, that there's no desire of women. Um, and then again, that's in verse number 37, nor the desire of women. So he does not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. I don't know what that means. I, I've, uh, I looked at it, a couple ideas. Some people have said, well, that means that he doesn't desire a relationship as a man with a woman. He doesn't desire that, so he's homosexual. He's what the Bible would call a sodomite. Um, maybe. Uh, some, some have referenced this as it, uh, something referencing back all the way to the book of Genesis when it describes that, uh, a, a, that her desire shall be unto her own husband. And the idea there, kind of the, the struggle there, but more so addressing that aspect of marriage. And so people talking about that, since this is going to be describing aspects of his of his rule, if you can say it that way, especially in the, the words to come, that, um, that he, this will be a time period in which he is, he is regarding, um, he, he's abandoning worship of God altogether because he's replaced himself, but also the home itself is be, kind of being abolished as far as that kind of thing goes. And by the way, we're seeing a lot of that, so it, it's possible, which would include, there would be the introduction of homosexuality as, as a active part because it Marriage doesn't matter, right, in this type of context. And so that, that's a very, a very good possibility. One more that was mentioned, which I don't, and I'm just telling you this because I have an uncertainty, and, and you're welcome to study this on your own as well. Um, the other part is that it could be read as the desire of the women, all right? So I'm not, I know I understand that, that I included the article of there, but desire of women would be like their own desires. The women, well, uh, women's desires are not regarded. In other words, the desire of, of bearing children, and in some ways, even uh, the messianic desires of, of women that wanted to bear a child for the purpose of bearing the, the Messiah, that, that wouldn't matter. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, as far as that goes. It could be that, that the idea of even continuing with having children in, in that manner, I'm not really sure. But the point is that there's, there's something different in regards to the family there. Uh, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So here's what happens. So 
he, um, he abandons the God of his fathers and then lowercase g, nor any God. And so you have these different things here. And so you have, you have two different things, which is why I believe that he is of Jewish descendancy because of the fact it makes uppercase G earlier on and then lowercase g. If it wasn't uppercase G as far as God himself, then he's just repeating the same thing, which he's repeated multiple times, in the, but in the same sentence. And so with this aspect, he's addressing the fact that there is an abolishment of basically other religions. So everything's kind of being done away with, and now he is the exalted one. And so he's the one that's, that's, that's uh, doing this. Now, going on, verse number 38. But in his estate, now in other words, the way he's going to run things. Um, so he won't do those things, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now, it's the God of forces. The word God, Elohim, the idea is uh, God, not in the sense of a proper name, but just God. But if you'll notice here, the God of, um, uh, honor the God of forces, the idea of, um, of one that is going to use violence. In other words, what is supreme and what is worshipped is the absolute violence and control of that way. To me, that seems to point to this, this idea of a violent dictator. What you would think of with any of our violent dictators when they would solve problems by use of swords, you would kill somebody, ha has an issue with you, there would be this upbringing of, of the desire for fighting and warfare and all that, and so, but that is supreme. And so um, this idea of, of the God of, of forces or the use of force. And a God, lowercase g, whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Based on Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, I think the God whom they knew not was Satan himself. I, I believe because they are not only worshiping this guy, they're worshiping the guy that, or they're worshiping the one that gave him power. And so they're worshiping him because he exalts himself, but they're also worshiping one whom they've not worshiped before, whom they knew not. I believe they're worshiping Satan at this point, the devil himself. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe it's a reference to something else, but just based on what he illuminates for us in the New Testament, it seems to give the details here is that's what's, what's taking place. And so there's a lot that's going on with, with the Antichrist himself. Uh, obviously, we would say this is very, very, very bad, right? Good. All right. So we were in agreement here. Um, so continuing on here, um, the other part is uh, right in the middle of verse 38. Shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things, the idea of the excesses and wealth and, and the, the high ex increase of material possession. Verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And so by the power of Satan himself, who is instructing and providing, provi um, giving provision for, to be able to expand rule and gains, which means by this point he has committed the abomination, abomination of desolation, but he continues to expand his rule further to basically everywhere. And so this is something that's going to continue on. Um, we'll find out later that he's going to have fights with people. He's not always getting along with everybody, but he's going to expand his, his rule, his, his kingdom um, with all this. But he's able to, pe to bless those that, that honor him and help him rule by giving them stuff. And boy, doesn't that seem like that's how the world works? In fact, we know that society right now, it works based on money. That's how it works, and, and uh, we know that just about anybody can be paid off, so we understand this is what's happening um, during this time, This is what, and it's just being laid out this way. This is how the world's working. This is how his estate is working. Go down to verse number, um, verse number um, 40, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries uh, and shall overflow and pass over. The idea is they're going to come up against this one, this man of sin, with great armies and great power. Um, earlier on, before 36, it would mention places by name. Um, you'll see a few names mentioned here, but it would mention, like, for instance, the ships of Shittim uh, and things like that. But in this case, it's, it's kind of broad. It's very, very broad, but they're going to come up against him with a lot of people. Uh, I've heard people say that the, 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 the east and the north, he's talking about um, when you start seeing some of these places, um, which you'll see a little bit later, he's talking about Japan and China, and then the north, he's talking about Russia. Um, maybe, I, I tend to believe, based on what he's going to say, he's going to include Moab and Edom. They're more locally centralized, so I believe areas like Syria and Jordan and those areas are going to be the ones involved. And not only that, he's going to mention 
Egypt. All the countries he mentioned are local countries to, that, to, to, um, to the Middle East there. And so anyways, uh, but they're going to go in. But what, is, what happens there? It shall overflow and pass over. He beats them. Verse 41. He shall, also, he shall enter also into the glorious land. He's talking about Jerusalem. It's been re referenced that way uh, several times throughout the book of Daniel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. So this is at the end. He's taken over everything, basically, except there's a couple countries that escape him, that, that he doesn't take over. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Those are the three nations that are directly east of Israel, currently, presently. Uh, he shall, in verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, which is a great kingdom. Verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and, of, and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountains. So if you notice, so far what's happening is he's taken over. Things are going great. But then he hears stuff that's going on both in the north and the east. Remember, you have the three um, nations to the east that have escaped him. If you go all the way up toward Moab, that could possibly be the northern one that he's talking, or maybe it's one that's not listed. The point is he's here in trouble, so he's going to go over there to overtake them. So he's still fighting. So he's, he's a man of war. So sometimes I, I look at him like, oh, everything's going peacefully except for Israel, and, and, and he's just destroying any believer out there, any, any Christians he's destroying there. But the truth is the way this is happening is that not everybody's getting along. Not everybody likes that rule. I have a guess, okay? This is complete speculation. But I do believe at this point what, what has happened, um, my guess is that what you're seeing is a political alliance with uh, a, a worldwide religious system like Roman Catholicism, for instance, which will be unified. Uh, and they're not going to convert the Muslims. I think the Muslims in those areas are not going to like what's going on, and they're going to kick them out. And they're going to keep fighting him during that time, in which he will subdue them a number of times, but they, they never fully submit to his rule. So. Anyways, that, that's an idea. We understand that the people that are fighting, like Moab, Edom, um, and uh, part of the ones from, uh, what was the other one, from Ammon, they're not believers. They're just other countries, okay? So, so they're, they're all wicked people that will eventually get destroyed. So, um, so anyways, that's something that's taking place there. So there is still a great deal of warfare that's going on. Continuing on here. Um, in verse 45, it's kind of depressing because he's been winning. And no, the way verse 45 is explaining, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. He's talking about Jerusalem there. He's saying he's going to have a tabernacle for himself, and they're going to build something better than the temple for God. They're going to build something about him, a shrine about him, something that is all praise to him. Just imagine big pictures and, and silhouettes and people bringing stuff, and this is his headquarters, and it's all about him there. This is the headquarters of the man of sin. But how does that, end? How does that verse end? Notice what the verse says. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. This is how it works. God wins. Listen, it sounds like he's winning, and so what we're going to see here is there's going to be a transition. So a lot of times when we would combine verse 36 through 45 with um, Antiochus Epiphanes is because there's a transition in chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the thing about it is the reason for that transition is because there's a transition from all his accomplishments to now what, everything that's actually going on. So we see the things that are going on. These would be the principalities and powers and spiritual darkness, uh, the, w the wickedness here in this world, the rulers in high place. We see this, but chapter 12 is a glimpse to what's really happening. Okay, chapter 12, verse 1. We'll go through this very quickly. Here. And, it, and at that time, the word at that time, uh, the typical context, we would say, like, okay, and then. But this one he's saying at that time. In other words, at the time of what? Of what's going on there. During this time where that is going on, something happens. What's going to be happening? Michael shall stand up. All right. Now, I'm just thinking a lot of noise when that happens. Uh, I also expect him to be like kind of sitting there waiting, uh, kind of like, Coach, put me in, put me in. He's got his sword there and his armor, and he's ready to go. And finally, it's time, Michael, and he stands up. Uh, and I just, I just, but the other thing is it's not just Michael, by the way, right? Well, I understand Michael is the archangel. In other words, he's like, uh, archangel sounds cooler than managing angel, but the word archangel kind of means managing angel. <laughs> so he's, he's in charge of others. So in other words, 
this leader. So in other words, we would say like this general led them to battle. You're not assuming that that general's going by himself. He's got an army. Michael, the archangel, stands up. All right, guys, it's time. Here it is. What are they going to be here for? Uh, at that time, so while this is going on, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now, this is a very big deal because earlier on, ever, or we had, we had talked about back in the book of Revelation, that the people that, that um, were written in the book didn't do what? They didn't worship. They didn't worship the beast. And so that puts them at odds. Kind of like when Nebuchadnezzar would set up a, a statue of gold and have everybody bow, and there happens to be three Hebrew boys that are not bowing. People notice this. He's going to cast them to the fire furnace, but God says that Michael is going to send forth his angels, this great prince who stands there with these angels to defend them. And so he's, he's there to serve the, the, the believers. Verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So can, and I'll get more to that on the, on the aspect of the uh, resurrection. Uh, and, they shall be, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I'll cover that again in just a second. Uh, verse, 40, verse 4, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end shall many run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, here's what he's saying. At this point, he's saying, look, in verse cha chapter number 12, the first couple of verses, he's saying that there's something bigger that's going on. He's going to give a broad thing. He's going to talk about the angels. He's going to talk about the resurrection. He's talking about judgment. And this idea of judgment, while he doesn't reference, he does reference the fact that there are those that will wake up to everlasting contempt. Some people say that, well, they're just going to kind of be ashamed that they didn't do much for Jesus. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about everlasting contempt. This is bad for them. He's talking about the fact that this is judgment. But the judgment he focuses on is not them. He focuses on specifically in verse number three, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Oh, so that sounds good. Now, I'm excited about preaching this because I realized I learned something really cool about the brightness that they're going to shine with that I'll get to in the resurrection message, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. I just, to me, that was the biggest thing. And I'm not going to tell you because it's going to, you know, there goes the thunder. So anyways, what we're going to do is talk about that later. But the point is there's a blessing involved in it. And so while it seems bleak and dark, but he's saying that there's something eternal happening and there's something big. He's got background forces working in the midst of all this darkness for the sake of, for, of his glory. And there's something eternal that's going to take place, which has eternal benefits and blessings. But he says to Daniel, hey, go ahead and close the book, though. In other words, close it up, finish it up. We're done for now. Now, that sounds good. But then verse 5, then I, oh, by the way, in verse 4, he does say that um, many shall run to and fro, the idea of going everywhere, and knowledge shall be increased. All right, so God says, I've got answers for you, but in the meantime, people are going to keep going everywhere looking for them, even though they're, they're right here. All right, now in verse number five, then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, um, stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other uh, on, the, on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Okay, verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven. So, declaration Double declaration, all right? This is what's going on. This is a big deal. And what does he say? And swear by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for a time, sorry, that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, what he's addressing here is that when it's done when he's done everything according to his plan and he said there's a specific amount of time it's going to be done according to a specific planning there's a few things that are mentioned here about halfway through and it shall be for a time times and a half so one time two times that's one two three and a half so we're talking about three three and a half times or years and and when he shall have accomplished to scatter 
the power of the holy people, all these things shall, shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. All right, so you read this and like, I, I don't get it. Now, I look at this and like, I, I, don't, I don't get a lot of it either. You're like, I, I think I get it, but I'm not sure about some of it. And Daniel's like, okay, it sounds, it sounds good, but I'm not sure what it means. All right, and that's kind of what's happening. Like, for instance, um, well, no, okay, for the sake of time, let's just keep going. In verse number, um, verse number um, next? eight, and I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? In other words, what, that was his, he asked, when's the end of these wonders? And like, I have the same question because I don't get it either. All right, the same question, verse 9. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed. And sealed. How long are they sealed for? Till the time of the end. Now, he's saying, look, don't worry about it. The words are here, and you're not going to understand them because they're not going to be available to understand them till the time of the end. Gives us an incredible picture into what prophecy's intent is. Prophecy is not for you to understand everything that's going to happen. In other words, when you see what's going to happen, it gives you confidence in what God is doing. But it lets you know what's happening. So, for instance, if you're going through any one of the prophecies in the, in the Bible that have already completed, they didn't necessarily know exactly how it was going to happen. But when it was happening, they knew it was happening. And so there's going to be a time period where people are going to be reading this one day like, hey, that guy, we shouldn't be listening to him because he did this. Don't listen to that guy because it's been opened up. Now, in other words, they know at the time of the end. But now here's the other question. When is the end? This is a big one. Now, there's a couple thoughts on this one that in the book of Hebrews, it describes that, um, I forgot which verse it was, 11, no, it's not 11, 11, 2, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heirs of all things, hath in these last days. And I used to always think that verse meant like, well, recently. But that's not the way the text is written. The text is written in these last days. The idea here is like since Jesus, in other words, Jesus was the initiator of last days. This is how it started taking place. It, this, this is the time of the resurrection. In fact, he was the, the firstborn of the res, first fruits of the resurrection. So we start, this is all what's taking place. This is the time frame. But he gives us something in this. He gives us a time frame. He gives us a three and a half year time frame as well. So I believe we will not fully understand all of this until the time frame that he listed here in chapter number 12, which is the time, times, and half time. In other words, he just gave us a handbook for those end times. And there's a lot of information there that, that we simply don't understand. And so uh, more, more will be understood there, and we'll talk more about that timing and all that information soon. But go down now to verse number, um, verse number 10. What do we do with this? Um, Verse 10, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And the idea here, he's pointing what's going to happen. During that time, they're going to be tried. And basically, the saved people are going to do what they're supposed to, and there's going to be many people are going to give in to the false stuff. But in the meantime, they have the Bible. And uh, verse number 11, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there should be 1,290 days. And so he's talking 1,290 days from the time of the abomination of desolations. That's not a pleasant time. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. And so he says, look, there's the bad, 1,290. Then he says, but then there's a blessing, 1,335. Uh, what's the significance of the dates? Well, there's a few ideas, and we're not going to get into all that right now, but I don't know. All right, I'm just going to tell you, like, I'm not certain. I have some, I guess, I have some guesses, but I'm just not going to go into those. Verse 13, but go thou thy way until the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Now, there's a couple interesting things. There's a lot there, okay, in that, in that one verse. For one, it gives us our obligation. What do you need to do? Just go on. Just do, do what you're going to do. In fact, he said, go on, you're going to die. It's not, the word rest there is a poetic way of saying that you're dying. He's not saying you're going to go into a soul sleep or anything like that, but you're, you're going to rest. In other words, it's not time for that work yet. Uh, the idea of rest, is you're waiting for what's going to need to be done. Um, so what, what do we need to do? We need to go on. And, and, and by the way, we know what's true, but we just go on. And, and by the way, if you die, it's, it's just time for your rest. Okay, that's what it's, what it's for, for. We'll rest in Christ. 
But he says something that's interesting that while we talk about the rest that we have in God fulfilled in him, he also says something at the very end um, that he'll stand in thy lot at the end of the days. He says it to one other person, that's John. So he says that at the end time, there's something for you to do. And so Daniel's got another job. And so there's a couple theories on this one. One of the most interesting ones is that there's going to be two people that are going to have a job to do at the end days during a three and a half year time period, and that is to preach. And, uh, and he's told two people that they haven't finished their job yet, and that's Daniel and John, and both who give revelation, both who give um, prophecy. Now, is it them? Are they the ones? I don't know. Uh, people have also said it's maybe it's, it's Enoch um, and, and uh, Elijah because they, they're translated. They don't die into the ground. Uh, some people say it's Moses and Elijah. I don't know, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, so who is exactly? I don't know. Uh, but regardless, it's an interesting thought when we go into this. And so the point is, the point is that there's information given. What he wants you to know is he's got a plan. This is what he wants Daniel to know. I've got a plan. And I want you to rest Rest in what? Well, when we're talking about dying, they, we can, you can die in peace. Uh, we don't have to fear. Listen, what's going on in the world right now? We don't have to fear. God, God's working out these plans and details. And like Esther said, if I perish, I perish. In fact, it's interesting, in chapter 12 of the book of Esther, when we talk about the, the, um, the, the feast of Purim, the word Purim literally means lots, like lots. The, the idea of like just whatever's been cast to you. In other words, it's random that shows up to you, but it's your spot. This is what you get and so the idea for Esther was this is her lot in life. This is what she had to do. This is what it laid on her for her job to be. And for Daniel says, you've got a job. I'll take care of whatever your lot will be. And for you, you've got a lot. You've got something you're supposed to do. You, make most of it advan- you take the most advantage of that, of giving it most, most energy and effort and, uh, and power to do what you're supposed to do. In the meantime, just go your way and do it. We don't know what the, the end is going to be exactly as far as timing, but when it's there, we'll know. But in the meantime, uh, just, just go and rest, saying that you don't have to be worried about this. And so here's what's crazy. He takes one verse say, chill, all right, chill. <clears throat> now, he spent a lot of time, we focus on everything else except verse, 12, verse 13, because we're like, that's kind of boring. But that's the point. Just like I said, chill, all right? That's not a Bible term, I don't think, as far as how we address people. But, but the, the, the point is that, um, that he's not giving this for you, for you to panic. That's not why it's there. Uh, and I, by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong to, to learn what's, going, what's there. Um, we're going to have, I'm not, do not raise your hand. But how many of you disagree with something that I said tonight? It's probably, probably most of you or some of you or one, I don't know. Maybe you're like, oh, I'll think about it. So maybe there's, but he, we might have disagreements about it. But here's the thing, I, I fully understand something I, that I don't understand everything. I don't understand everything I've said here. Uh, and so, um, so anyways, with that, God gives us great hope. And Daniel, he's telling him, look, I've got this. Here, here's what we have to do. Apply the application he's given to you. This is going to be done according to my plan. Go rest. Do what you're supposed to. All right? That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, one big thing, by the way, um, according to the judgment he's going to say, those that shine, those are the, the wise ones. In verse number three, they that turn many to righteousness. All right? So when it comes to it, Daniel's one of those that he's going to shine because he turned many to righteousness. That's what he did. He ministered. You can do the same thing. Where that's the eventual, what we're looking for, the eternal thing, that we'll shine because we're turning many to righteousness. We, we're soul winners. We're people that lead people to Christ. That's what we do. All right. So, anyways, that's, that's the application for you tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Thank you so much, Father, for the time you've given. Bless us now as we take these and apply them. And I pray for our prayer time, God, that we'd be spirit-filled, be wanting to do what you want us to do, Father. Lord, you're so good and we're so grateful for the time you've given. In Jesus' name, amen.